I was living in Lima, Peru several years ago when I got interested in book piracy. Books are big business in Peru, and the fake book industry is actually bigger than the legitimate book industry. For a writer, being pirated is like getting on the bestseller list. One day, I visited an area of Lima known as La Parada. I was there to meet an old man who made books by hand from discarded paper and cardboard. His workshop smelled powerfully of glue and resin. Whenever I strayed toward the door for fresh air, he would warn me about thieves. He wasn't wrong to worry. It's no exaggeration to say La Parada is one of the bleakest neighborhoods I've ever visited. There was something comforting about finding book culture here, and not just in his shop. Right outside his door on the sidewalk, a woman had laid out a display of cheaply printed books on a rotting wooden door balanced on cinder blocks. One of them stood out. It's called Speeches and Toasts. Keys to speaking in public, it says on the cover. Speeches for every occasion. Its bright, colorful optimism couldn't have felt more out of place considering where we were standing. You don't see a lot of this in La Parada. Or this. So I bought it, and years later, it's still one of my favorite books. I mean, who isn't afraid of public speaking? Here in these pages, I found, for example, this. Discurso por el fin de una carrera política. Speech for the end of a political career. Today, I'm not here to capture votes. Instead, I'm here to give you my own vote of gratitude. Or this. Discurso de un huérfano en el día del padre. Speech by an orphan on Father's Day. Because it was a father who cared in their infancy for the geniuses who transformed the world and whose triumphs have been registered by history, would we have all the wonders of the world without these men? It is hardly hyperbole to say that Father's Day is the most important holiday on the calendar. Or this, discurso de homenaje de un niño a visita de autoridades de educación, a speech a student might give on the occasion of a visit by local education officials. It is an honor for this village and an inspiration to its children to receive two esteemed educators who work for the intellectual growth of the province of blank within whose jurisdiction lies this village which has placed its hopes in you because this year you are entrusted with the sacred mission of teaching. Long live instruction. Long live the fatherland. I love the Baroque specificity of it. I love the grammatical tight ropes, the grandiosity of every emotion. It's all oddly moving. Because I've seen people give speeches like this. Some of them have been my family members. The cover might not show it, but this book is very Peruvian. There are wedding toasts, sure, toasts to give at a bachelor party or on your mother's birthday, but you can find that in any book of the genre, from any country. Tell me where else you could find Palabras de elogio a un pescador fallecido, a sample text for the eulogy of a drowned fisherman. We'll no longer find Juan sitting on the shore. We'll no longer hear him tell stories of fishermen. He'll never throw a line into the water again. And though his fishing nets are empty today, our eyes are filled with tears. Or this helpful speech. Palabras de un miembro institucional en la inauguración de un radio receptor. Words offered by a member of an institution on the occasion of the inauguration of a radio receiver. These modern times have arrived to offer us this receiving machine now installed in the social hall of this club, from where it will not only capture information from all over the world, but offer the same back to the people so that they may participate in the news that travels atop the ethereal waves directly to our ears all those events taking place throughout this diverse and fractured globe where we earthlings reside. It's one of dozens of speeches inaugurating things. There's also a tribute by a grateful youth to a gentleman benefactor, a speech in a theater introducing a comedic group, conveniently a response to a speech in a theater introducing a comedic group. It goes on and on. From time to time, when I'm feeling nostalgic for our peculiar, exaggerated speech patterns, I'll crack this book open and feel like I'm home again. It's not poetry, not exactly, but it's not not poetry, you know? The more I've thought about it, the more I've come to realize this is much more than an overwritten little self-help book. See, Peru is a country defined and divided by language. There are 15 different families of languages. The most widely spoken indigenous language, Quechua, is a native tongue for five million or so Peruvians. In fact, it's been an official language since 1975, but in the real world, that doesn't mean much. In Peru, there's only one language that matters, one language that means progress and possibility and access and money, Spanish. In Peru, how you talk matters almost as much as how you look. 
That's what this book is really about. It's about the cultural, linguistic, and ethnic divide between the Andean and the Creole worlds, between the mountains and the coast, between the poor and the rich. For many Peruvians, particularly those of indigenous descent, being in command of formal Spanish means the possibility of getting ahead. And that's what everyone wants, right? So you have books like this one, in a place like La Parada. When you look at this book, you aren't looking at some funny little artifact. What you're actually seeing is something else. It's an attempt at healing a national wound. There's no speech addressing this. There's no soothing discourse on the bifurcated identity of a country fractured by its own complicated and troubling history. There's no tribute to the possibility of creating a whole from disparate, often warring cultural tribes that constitute, for now, a purely imaginary nation. There's no homage to the quixotic 200-year-old attempt to hide the fault lines intrinsic to this national project from our very first, very flawed moment. None of those speeches are in this magical little book. I know, because I looked. El Salvador is the murder capital of the world, with a rate 22 times that of the United States. Gang and police violence has overrun the country, disproportionately targeting young people. The country's divided, but there's one group that's been able to stay neutral in all of this. They're called Los Comandos de Salvamento, or the Green Cross. They're a group of volunteer paramedics, many of them still in their teens, who will help anyone, regardless of gang affiliation. It was at their headquarters that I met Mimi. My name is Stephanie Noemi Vanegas Aguilar. I have 16 years old. Todos me dicen Mimi. Buena, por la seguridad. Cuando llego a la base, me cambio, me pongo un uniforme. Siento que soy otra persona. Ya no soy la Mimi como. Y me siento bien protegida y me gusta andar ese uniforme. Así como le dije a ahí, no es blindado, pero... Señor de mis semejantes. Señor de mis semejantes. Señálame. El buen camino frente al peligro. El buen camino frente al peligro. Concédeme. Concédeme. Cumplir con humildad. Cumplir con humildad. La misión que voluntariamente he abrazado. La misión que voluntariamente he abrazado. Amén. Amén. Dos. Descanso. Me encanta ayudar a las demás personas. No me gusta ni ver, ver sufrir a otras personas. ¿Cuántos somos? Uno. Solo ella. ¿Se acuerda cómo se llama su hija? ¿Cómo se llama? ¿Cómo? ¿Losario qué? Tranquilita, sí. Respira despacio. Sí, ya. No, no me lo cierre. No me cierre los ojos. Voy. Mimi lives with her father and grandmother in La Montreal, one of the most violent areas of San Salvador. Mimi's neighborhood is controlled by MS-13, one of the largest and most violent gangs in the country. Young lookouts at the entrance of her community report by text message to their superiors, noting who comes in and who goes out. One wrong turn could lead to robbery, kidnapping, or worse. Cuando me toca irme para la escuela, eh, ahí comienza como el nuevo riesgo de todos los días. Mi temor yo con ella es vaya digamos aquí más que todo las pandillas porque si vos te fijas en un muchacho de pandilla ya no puede voltear a ver para otro lado porque hasta allí llegaste la verdad es que aquí el país está muy peligroso más que todo para la juventud en vez de nosotros escoger las cosas malas 
No me agarra a la calle, así como dicen, aquí. Pero aquí ser joven es como, ser, es como que fuera un delito, porque... Y se andan Nike, Adidas, dicen que son de la MS. O sea, ser joven ahora es como que es lo peor que podemos estar pasando. Mimi started working with Los Comandos five years ago, when she was just 11 years old. She tended to wounded gang members, toddlers. She worked with the morgue to retrieve bodies from clandestine graves. On Fridays after school, she works the overnight shift and stays at the Comandos headquarters all weekend. There, she gets to hang out and be a normal teenager. It's the one place she feels safe. But in April of last year, everything changed. A 14-year-old paramedic named Eric was brutally murdered at a Comandos headquarters in a town not far from San Salvador. He was killed for refusing to join a local gang. His death shocked Mimi and the rest of the Comandos. Because their organization helps everyone, they're respected by gangs, civilians, and police alike. And usually, they're left alone. Nothing like this had ever happened before. Most of the kids, including Mimi, stopped working for a couple of weeks. She used to say wearing her yellow jumpsuit protected her in a way. But she realized what happened to Eric could just as easily happen to her. Recientemente, quien se fue fue mi primo y mi amiga. Les ha costado. Ellos me dicen, mira, si tienes la oportunidad de irte, andate. Me dicen, en la situación como es aquí de peligrosa. Puede ser alguien mejor. Le digo, es que allá me da miedo irme. To migrate north, Mimi would have to travel with smugglers to the borders of Guatemala and Mexico, risking the threat of violence and sexual abuse during the long journey on buses and trains. But the thing that worries Mimi the most is leaving her family. What awaits her after a journey to the U.S. is unknown and terrifying, and she'd have to do it alone. On the other hand, there's the fear of staying in El Salvador, a place that all but promises an early death. But at least that's a familiar fear, one that Mimi is used to. Sentí un momento de eso de pensar, de pensar, será que voy a regresar, será que no voy a regresar. Pero gracias a Dios hasta ahorita el temor ese se me ha ido ahorita. De morir, tenemos que morir, pero uno no puede saber si hasta dormido le puede pasar eso. Mira. Yo tengo que seguir adelante como que nada. The director of Los Comandos told me their yellow shirts mean hope. Hope for themselves, hope for their neighbors, and hope for the people of El Salvador. Una vida en mis manos se siente algo emocionante. Me encanta, pues. Y mi, mi fortaleza, mis ánimos de seguir ayudándoles a las personas siguen. Mi miedo afuera y eso adentro de regreso. I'm a proud Juban American. That's Jewish, Cuban, and American. How we ended up in Miami where I was born, it's a saga. But thanks to my family, resilience is in my DNA. My dad's parents were Eastern European Jews who left Germany after surviving the Holocaust. They were searching to find a new home, a new country, somewhere safe. So they did what a lot of immigrants do. You track down any distant relative you can think of, then you make your way to that place. And for them, it was Cuba. 
Life was good in Havana for both sides of my family. The stories they would tell about days spent at the beach, nights at the Tropicana, heavenly, my aunt likes to say. But then in the early 60s, the political climate changed. You would tell your neighbors, hey, we're going on vacation to Miami, see you in a couple weeks. But you'd leave forever with little more than a suitcase in each hand and silverware and jewelry sewn into your coat lining. The one thing my abuelas, abuelos, and tias and tios all took with them, no matter how little space they had, were the stories and memories. What's in your mind, la mente, can never be left behind, no matter where you are. In 2017, I wanted to find a way to connect more families like mine, one spread out all over the world through stories. I co-founded Caribou, a video calling app made for kids to read books together with their beloved familias near and far, allowing us all to keep alive the tradition of creating and passing down stories to future generations. As we celebrate Hispanic Heritage Month and the resilience of our community, I'm thankful for the tools and support that Google provides to help me and other Latinx entrepreneurs adapt, grow our businesses, and connect families and neighbors around the world. Enjoy our story. Thank you. Gracias. Cerca de mí vive gente que nunca deja de buscarle. De la carnicería que no nos falla los domingos. Esa. O los de la farmacia que ahora te traen las medicinas. Es gente que le busca y le busca y encuentra la manera. Por eso, si estás buscando cómo ayudar, la respuesta está aquí, a la vuelta de la esquina. All my life, my friends have told me I give great advice. Well, no, they haven't. But that hasn't stopped me. I write an advice column called Hola Papi, sort of like a Mexican Dear Abby for LGBTQ Latinx people all over the world. People just like the ones whose letters we're going to answer today. Well, actually, I'm going to answer them. You're going to sit there and watch. Vamos. Hola Papi. I went on a pretty comically bad date. Yeah, I screwed it up somehow. I'm a Latino guy who was on a date with another Latino. I asked him where he was from. He told me Florida, but then I very stupidly asked what kind of Latino he was. He took offense, I apologized, and he didn't hang up on me or anything, but the weird feeling kind of lingered. Papi, what did I do wrong? And can I make amends? Signed, Hispanic. Wow, the gay Latinos are going on dates again. Nature is healing! I can understand why this guy took offense, Hispanic. It's a loaded question for many Latinxes, especially those of us from immigrant communities that have historically been othered. When people ask, where are you from? It's often that addendum, even if it's unspoken. No, but where are you from? You just said that part out loud, I think. It really reminds me that there are so many experiences housed under the umbrella of Latino. There are Spanish speakers, non-Spanish speakers, Afro-Latinos, mixed race Latinos, vaguely brown boys who live in Brooklyn and are a little too online, etc. The thing is, Hispanic, is that you can be Latino and still do harm or insult other Latinos because we don't all come from one experience. It doesn't give you license to be a pendejo, you know? I think you could casually apologize and say something like, hey, I'm sorry if that question made you uncomfortable, and then leave the proverbial palota in his court. Also, I can't believe Florida wasn't enough for you. Florida is essentially Latin America, is it not? But I digress. Hola, papi. I'm only half Mexican. My Spanish also kind of sucks. How do I become a more authentic Latino? Do I need to, like, move to Guadalajara or something? Maybe I could just learn how to make enchiladas. You see what I'm going for here, right? Signed, Latinx, except not really. Hey, which half? Left, right, top, bottom. Es broma. No, but really, people aren't fractions. I once felt a lot like you, being a mix myself. I even started working at a tortilla factory just to prove to myself I could be Mexican enough. All I learned how to say was, I thought you said beef in Spanish, which to be fair, is not nothing. I think we as Mexican Americans should stop worrying so much about being authentic. I mean, I'm a Mexican and I'm a homosexual Brooklynite who bought a rhubarb scone from the farmer's market this morning and has panic attacks about accidentally drowning my euphorbia plant. If I can do it, so can you. So try not to sweat it. And remember, Pensé que habías dicho carne de res. Hola, papi. I have yet to come out to my very traditional Latino family. 
My abuelos are the stereotypical Puerto Rican older couple, very Catholic, very about me getting married to a man and having nietos. At least they're Walter and Mercado stands. The thing is, Papi, I'm an out and proud lesbian Latina in my real life, but real life is on hold for now. I'm stuck in this house with my family, living a lie. I'm not so much asking if I should come out to my family as much as I'm asking, am I a hypocrite? Signed, La Menterosa. Hola, Menterosa. I'm glad you're not asking me how to come out to your abuelos whom I've never met. That would be hard, and I'm lazy. Sounds like you're feeling uncomfortable about having to navigate multiple identities. Being queer, being Latina, and being, well, a member of a family. Most people have to put on different faces for different situations. But it tends to feel a little bit more weighted when we're talking about an identity you had to fight for, one that you felt you had to keep secret for a good chunk of your life. It's especially difficult, I imagine, if you find yourself stuck at home with your traditional family while your life out with your friends feels like it's been taken away. I understand completely why you might feel like you're losing the real you. But this is a unique, trying time we're in, Mentorosa. Everything is rearranging, everything is falling apart and being built anew. So my advice to you for now is to just let this be abnormal. Let this time be strange. You're not a hypocrite for feeling like you have to act differently around your family. You're just pushing through a situation like so many of us are. So take off this extra pressure you're putting on. Lean on your friends. And remember that our queer and Latino histories are full of struggles with assimilating, finding ourselves, and overcoming adversity. You're doing this on your own time. There's nothing more honest than that. Con mucho amor, Papi. Imagine a warm Friday night in Southern California. Maybe you're playing soccer outside under the streetlights or watching movies inside when suddenly everything goes dark. So if the power goes out for everyone around me still to this day, the city will go out and help everyone except our neighborhood last. That's Rachel Smith. And these blackouts were a part of her childhood in the unincorporated part of Whittier, a sleepy town southeast of downtown Los Angeles. Where I'm from is predominantly a uh, Hispanic working class neighborhood. So I'm Mexican-American. Um, everyone I know in my neighborhood is Latinx. The blackouts were an early lesson in the way things work and don't work. But there were other lessons too. Rachel's mom is a painter. She's still down to make art with Rachel and her friends anytime. Her dad was a machinist who could build just about anything. So I always kind of had technology and art growing up. I was involved in various art communities, so I helped in creating flyers for shows or helped with art projects. I basically have been a creative pretty much my whole entire life. Rachel was winding down her weekend when her job emailed everyone to stay home. The virus had arrived. I specifically remember the date, it was March 15th. I honestly, I felt really overwhelmed. I felt isolated. Rachel is a UX designer for Nordstrom. UX design stands for user experience design. A lot of people think that it applies solely to website designing, but actually it's just designing for human behavior. She wondered if there were other designers out there who wanted to do something to fight coronavirus. So she bought the URL designed to combat COVID-19.com and created her first Slack community. She invited friends on Twitter. Overnight, 100 people joined. Designers could propose a new project, create a new Slack channel, and then go. Some people designed posters with health and safety info for Canadian hospitals. Others went hunting for translators or mask sewing guides. It was a start but a little scattered. I think a tendency in humans is to always want to create solutions right away. Like, let's fix this problem. But as a user experience person, you really have to take a step back and think about, okay, am I solving for the right problem? Pretty soon, the group noticed something. A lot of their projects were trying to get masks and face shields into the hands of doctors and nurses. So a new community emerged, Masks for Docs, co-founded with another volunteer, Chad Loader. They built a website with 3D printing templates, mask making guides, and resources in multiple languages. They grew to 5,000 volunteers across six continents. One chapter sent 500 face shields to food delivery volunteers in Seattle. In New York, 
dozens of bikers formed a moto squad to ship supplies to local hospitals. In San Francisco, Jeannie Lindquist and her Star Wars Cosplay Club used to get together to sew costumes. She organized costume clubs across the city to sew more than 1,000 masks. Alex Torres is 18 years old and the co-chair of the Mass for Docs chapter in Santa Clara, California. He just graduated. He delivered his salutatorian speech into a webcam. Alex played marimba in his high school's marching band and ran a Dungeons and Dragons club. He got into 3D printers and engineering class and his parents surprised him and bought him one, but he didn't know what to do with it until March. It was on March 13th, ironically enough, Friday the 13th, when to me, the world seemed to stop spinning. School went remote. Everything went remote. Alex felt lost. Then his mom saw someone making 3D printed face shields on a YouTube video. Alex dug out his printer and found Mass for Docs templates online. School has what defined my existence before March 13th. Afterwards, I wasn't really sure until Mass for Docs came around. Then my purpose became helping out those in need and those who needed the PPE the most. Alex started calling around to tech companies looking for 3D printers he could borrow. One printer became two printers and then four. The family living room turned into a makerspace. He ran the printers 24 hours a day. They have a sort of hum to them. Like it'll go like, mm -hmm. And it's a noise that we actually got very used to after a while. Added up, Masks for Docs has delivered more than 100,000 masks and face shields around the world. It hasn't been easy. We had folks we knew personally who were contracting COVID, who were getting sick. It just felt like the circle around us was getting smaller and smaller. Our volunteers were just dropping left and right. There's a term I learned from some mutual aid folks. It's called empathy exhaustion. You feel like you want to help constantly, but it ends up taking a toll on you mentally. And I have volunteers who are coming to me literally crying, saying, I don't know if I could handle this pressure anymore. I would say that when we had these moments of seeing pictures of doctors and nurses holding the personal protective equipment that we were providing, that those were the moments where I was like, okay, this is real. We aren't just sweating and crying and doing all this hard work for nothing. This fall, Rachel and her network are looking for new ways to contribute, like getting masks to teachers who have to return to the classroom. Alex is sending most of his face shields to farm workers. We moved on to helping out farm workers, because even though they're not what people think of when they think frontline responders, they're still the ones who are looking to get food on our plates. And they're one of the highest risk groups, like disproportionately when compared to the others. So if there's ever a moment where folks think they can't make a difference, you absolutely can. People are listening, people want to help, and people definitely want to step up, especially during this time. I stand at your gate, and the song that I sing is of moonlight. I stand, and I wait for the touch of your hand in the June night. The roses are sighing, a moonlight serenade. The stars are aglow, and tonight, how their light sets me dreaming. My love, do you know that your eyes are like stars brightly beaming? I bring you and I sing you a moonlight serenade. Since the late Middle Ages, a serenade has required a few key ingredients. You need someone in love and you need a beloved. You need that love to be unrequited, a love that is in route, in the air. You need a voice to sing a song, and if it was still the Middle Ages, you'd need a lute. But now, an acoustic guitar will do just fine. In Mexico, where the serenades continue to live its most vibrant contemporary life, it's usually delivered by a squad of moral support, a mariachi of plucked strings, caressed violins, and chirping trumpets. 
A serenade also requires physical distance. The lover who is separated from the beloved, divided by position, by place. The lover is down on the street. The beloved is up on the balcony. The serenade has always needed a wall. The Metropolitan Detention Center in downtown Los Angeles is a towering nine-story slab of imposing concrete and razor wire. Its facade is packed with small slivers of windows. Behind them, men and women are locked in cells, many of them from Central America and Mexico, picked up for having the wrong papers, for overstaying visas, for driving without licenses, for missing deportation deadlines. Some will stay here for weeks and months awaiting trial. Others are about to be deported, dumped back somewhere south of the borderline. This detention center, like the over 200 others scattered across the United States, is a factory of limbo and removal, separation and loss. One evening, on the sidewalk below the detention center's northern wall, a group of musicians had just finished playing a set. The band, Los Jornaleros del Norte, the day laborers of the north, is made up of former and working day laborers. When they're not playing immigration marches or protesting in front of City Hall or leading songwriting workshops for other laborers, they perform at the foot of the detention center, sending their songs up to jump the gate, to scale the wall, to bend the bars. As the band was packing up their instruments, their singer Omar Leon noticed a woman standing nearby with two young kids holding balloons and a poster board that read, Te queremos mucho, te extrañamos, we love you so much, we miss you. Omar introduced himself. She told me, well, there's a time during the day, more, mainly after dinner, when the prisoners walk from the lunch area towards their cells, and they are able to see. Some of them, they can look for like seconds, and they can see their families waving up at them, and they can see like the signs. That's why some people choose to come here. She brought the kids here so they could wave to their father, and he could glimpse his children for a moment from a distance. To hell with the damn north, she said. To hell with this country. It was a feeling the band knew well. Back in 1996, their co-founder was in the parking lot of a Kmart waiting to get his blood drawn at a mobile health clinic when he had to take off running to escape an immigration raid. When he made it home, shaken, he turned the experience into a song. He eventually shared it with Pablo Alvarado, an immigrant rights organizer, and Los Jornaleros del Norte were soon born. Their mission was urgent from the start, to use music, to tell stories of migrant life in America, and to help fight for the rights of the undocumented. When Omar heard the woman's story that day outside the detention center, he remembered being a child back in Mexico, separated from his own parents, by gates, by walls, by distance. Omar's parents left him behind when they came to the U.S. He headed north a year and a half later, crammed into the floorboards of a car that crossed the border at Tijuana. Uh, they put me all the way in the bottom, and some of the people were stepping on me. So it was the longest, longest ride in, in my life. I couldn't breathe. But we finally make it. As he headed home from the detention center, he remembered his panic and the grief of separation and how music can address it. As I jumped into my car, I was thinking about what we do in our home countries. We bring serenata when you're in love or when you wanna ask for forgiveness from your loved one, you bring music, especially at nighttime, and ask for forgiveness or express your love. What we did is a serenata, but it wasn't a serenata to just anybody. It was a serenata to an indocumentado, an undocumented person. They judge us as criminals, he wrote. Don't they know that our hands are the hands that feed them? Omar gave the song to his bandmate Lloyd Alvarado to sing so that her voice could become the grieving mother's. Wherever you go, I will follow. 
What is the point without you? They went into the studio, recorded a single, and it got played on LA radio. Day laborers heard La Serenata at job centers across the city. The mother's story, not far from any of their own. Just one more story in a city full of the separated and the detained and the gone. A city full of love that is still in the air. The next time Los Jornaleros played in front of the detention center, they performed La Serenata. As the glow of security lights took over for a setting sun, their performance followed all the rules of a classic serenata. They were down below, singing up to a window. There was a wall, there was a gate, there was distance. Although you're imprisoned, Loida sang, someone who loves you is singing. One by one, the detention center's cell windows began to light up, blinking on and off in time with the music. The windows twinkled like dreams illuminated, like stars aglow, like moonlight.
que sin ti ya pa' qué Thank you. 